Greetings. A lot of us working on layouts encounter situations where we have one code of rail to join to another code of rail. In my case, we use code 70 for most of the main lines and such and switches, and then code 55 for the sidings, uh, smaller branch type track, and so on. That means we've got to join code 70 to code 55, which is going to be a little bit of a trick, but not bad. Now, in the larger rail sizes, code 83 and code 100 and so on, you can buy commercial adapters and that you, uh, rail joiners that you plug into one side, allows you to more or less fit the other rail right up against it, and it works pretty well. I don't think they're available for the smaller sizes like this, but you can use commercial rail joiners to be able to make this project happen pretty easily. Now, it, it, it may seem kind of intimidating when you watch a how-to like this because you have to go through every step of the process. But once you learn how to do it, it's really not bad. It doesn't take very long, and the results can be very nice. So, let's get started. What I have here is a curved switch, a Shinohara Code 70, coming in off the 9 line, or the main logging line. We have one Code 55 siding or landing rail that's already been connected here and another one that we need to add. Now this um, is an interesting circumstance because not only are we at this point transitioning from code 70 to code 55, the homosote is a little bit thinner on this side than it is on the switch side. This is fairly common. Homosote tends to be a little bit irregular in shaping or in size sometimes. We also need to uh, do a little bit of shimming with a piece of a business card but we'll go into some detail on that in a bit. And that just provides a little bit of a smoother transition so the, so the rail doesn't have to dip down due to the thinner homosote here. I use my little duckbill needle nose pliers here. Now you can see where I've already gone in and I've installed the rail joiners on the Code 70 here on both tracks. And I've gone in and squeezed the outside of the joiner on the code 55 side so that flattens out the the rail joiner on the code 55 side and creates a sort of a flat spot where the rail can rest while it's being connected here occasionally you might need to uh, bend it back down a little bit and that little flat area coincidentally is about the right height to allow you to make this connection. Uh, there's a little, you know, a, a little bit of a bump there. Now there's two things that are important when you're making a joint like this. First, the rail on the inside has to be consistent. The rail head on the smaller rail is narrower than the larger rail, but you want to keep the inside of the rail joints lined up because that's where the wheels are rolling. And the other detail is you want the tops to be level as much as possible. You can do a little bit of filing to make some fine tuning there, but you want the top of the rails to be level side to side as well. That just makes a smooth trouble-free joint for later for use later on. One detail to be aware of here, the rail joiner is connected to the code 70 normally. It's flat out here, but where you squeezed it, there's a little bit of a ramp, so to speak, uh, an angled area between the flat area and the regular rail joiner. And that angled area means that the rail will not be able to quite butt up to the adjacent one cleanly. So what I do is I take a file and I just file a very small angle on the base of the rail here in order to allow the rail to butt up cleanly against the adjacent code 70. And if it doesn't butt up altogether tight, that's fine too because frankly a little bit of a gap there leaves a bit of a click click noise as the train goes over and some people kind of like that. So anyway, I filed this little bit of an angle here, butt it right up against the adjacent rail and that allows you to make this nice and smooth. So I take a couple of weights to start with and just plop them down out here on the rail to kind of hold it in place and keep this from shifting around too much while I'm working over here. 
but I still want to clamp this securely in place here at the joint before I start any soldering. And I've got a special tool I want to talk about that I use for that. This is a tool I've been using for a very long time. It is a pair of clothespins. As you can see, uh, they are glued together with a couple of chunks of sticks on the back side like this. And the sticks glue one side together, so that's what mounts the whole thing into a single unit. The jaws have been trimmed off so that they come down to kind of a point down here for a, a tight, close grip. And the advantage, the, the idea here is th there is also another piece of wood down here between these two jaws that you can see I've been burned a little bit of soldering. And these two jaws work independently. And the purpose behind this tool is take this little wide piece of uh, stick, for example, and we'll take a skinnier piece of this stick and butt these two together. And this is the tool that I use for holding my rail in place for soldering. You can kind of see here how the stick serves as the more or less the bearing surface. And because these two jaws work independently, this one is holding on to the wide stick by itself. This one is holding the narrow stick. But the inside surface of both of these is perfectly lined up braced up against this, this backing cross piece here. And imagine this is the larger of the two railhead sizes, and this is the smaller of the two railhead sizes. You put this, this part of the stick, the backer, on the inside of the gauge, which is, as we showed you in the drawing, you know, where you want to maintain your gauge. And regardless of how wide the heads are, this keeps the inside edge of the rails perfectly in line while you're soldering them together. This little thing, God, this must be 10 or 15 years old, and uh, it has always worked great. I use a little bit of flux on all of my solder joints. Works really well, helps the so solder flow smoothly and cleanly into the joint. Doesn't take much, just a little bit of a dab on a stick is all you need. As for soldering, you do not need a soldering iron that's as big as a horse's leg to accomplish soldering on model railroad rail. This is a little 25 watt Weller unit. I use it for all of my soldering rail joiners, uh, pow DCC power feeders, DCC wiring, whatever. It works great. A little bit of flux on top of the rail joiner where the small size rail will sit. And a little bit on the rail joiner for the larger size rail. Position the rail in place more or less, and we've got it held down behind there. And this is where we, of course, look at it and eyeball it, make sure that everything's lined up like it's supposed to be. Again, I'm going to put the bearing surface here against the inside of the rail head, and we just clamp it down, and the jaws of the clothespins on these sides grab the outside of the rail head. The inside of the rail head is held in place in alignment by the little backer board. Clamp my curved tip pliers here on the rail, which serve as heat sinks to keep the ties from melting anywhere nearby. Now for the moment of truth, as they say. Just a little bit of heat on there. And let the solder flow right in nicely. And heat up the larger rail. Likewise, the solder will flow nicely into the joiner there. Use a bit of lacquer thinner with a stiff bristled oil painting type brush. This is great for cleaning the last of the flux off the joint after you make the solder joint. And take this off. Next, scrub it down with a little bit of lacquer thinner just to get the uh, 
remains of the flux off of there. Clean it up so the flux doesn't dry on it and so it'll also accept paint later as needed. You can come in then with a, a flat file and then of course come in on the inside and file just a little. Knock down any solder or anything that might have been in there. That's a pretty nice little joint. The last step for me is polishing the rail head with some roughly 1500 grit, that's 1500 wet or dry sandpaper. This stuff you can get in the body sh local uh, auto parts store in the body shop uh, hardware section or you can get it at a local hardware store. It does a very nice job of polishing up the rail head, gets rid of scratches from the files and the like. Here we have the finished rail joint, code 70 on one side, code 55 on the other. Nice, fairly smooth interface here on the uh, bearing surface on the inside of the rail. Fairly smooth on the top too. That'll work. And the joint is still nice and smooth. Seems to work okay, which is good. But due to that dip, I'm going to take a piece of this card stock, literally a chunk cut from a business card, slide that in there, and now when I spike it down, it'll make more of a gradual kind of a ramp down to the lower uh, level homosote. There you have it. One very nice transition joint between code 70 and code 55 rail. Didn't take that long to do. It's a lot easier to do when you're just doing the work rather than having to stop and shoot video and all that stuff. It's not hard to do. There are a lot of different ways to make rail joint transitions like this. Take a look at them. You might find another one that works better for you. This system works well for me. It has for an awful lot of years. So I'm going to keep doing this one. And you might want to uh, give it a try too. Who knows? It might work for you.